You know, there's, I mentioned it a while ago, Ford Service started, you know, the issue that, you know, we got people out traveling and people who are sick and have COVID, and we want to remember them and keep them in our prayers and stuff and keep moving forward. But we're going to talk today about spiritual warfare again. You know, we're going, working through this part of the book of Ephesians, and we're going to talk through that. Today we're going to talk about the gospel of peace and what does that mean to us and how does it really relate in today's world with us as opposed to, you know, the something of what people might make it into, you know, some type of set of rules or regulations or whatever. you got to do this and you got to do it this way. We're going to talk a little bit more of a generic thing like that. But we're going to talk about the gospel of peace, and we're going to start off with, by going uh, to 2 Corinthians and see what this has to say. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging this spiritual war, the spiritual battle, the things that come against us. We're not doing that through our own human nature, our own way of doing things. We're going to do it God's way. And that's what Paul is getting at and talking in the Bible about, you know, we, we may actually live in this human nature with all of the trials and tribulations, the craziness of politics, you know, the car that won't start, I got a battery that needs to be changed, or I got a flat tire, I, you know, all of these things that happen in the real world that we have to deal with. You know, things that come against us, things that cause us trouble, that cause us to want to think that, you know, God's forgotten about us or there's some kind of problem and it distracts me from what I need to do or it makes me angry or it makes me frustrated. And so I'm not living, you know, the kind of fulfilled, righteous, godly life that God's calling me to do because of all these things that are happening. But the way we combat that is spiritual. It's not physical, you know, in terms of, you know, the way the world says to do things. We need to do the way things God calls us to do it, the way Scripture talks about. So that's what we're going to talk about today, because these spiritual methods, these spiritual warfare things, you know, they have really spiritual power to destroy those kind of strongholds in our lives, but also in the world around us, the way the world sees things. Remember, uh, what I've talked about before when started this series is that the, the book of Romans talks about how the unrighteousness of the world, people who don't have a relationship with God, they suppress the truth because of their unrighteousness. You know, they don't know what the truth of the Word of God is. They don't have a relationship with God. So they're living either under spiritual bondage or they're living under a worldly system. And so they're opposed to the way God is trying to establish things and what's righteousness and what's godly in the world. So they're opposed to that. And it's not because they're trying to be, well, most of them anyway, are not trying to be evil. They're not trying to oppose God. Thing. They just don't know what those things are. And people have no idea about what's in Scripture a lot of times or what the, the purpose of it is. I used to introduce myself to new people, but, you know, when they, you know, it's, uh, you know, my name, Ray Luke and stuff like that. And I, I mentioned that the last name I named after my great, 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 great grand uncle who wrote the, the gospel of Luke. And people would look at me like, what? They don't know what gospel means. They don't know what's in the Bible. They don't know that there is a gospel according to Luke. They don't, you know, they have no idea. And so, and I'm thinking, well, I thought these people were church people. But, you know, they didn't know. They had no clue about this. So we're going to talk about what does it really mean from a scriptural perspective to do this. So Paul's talking about in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, you know, verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of His might. Be strong is a passive word. It's to receive God's strength. It's to allow God's strength to work through us. It's not something we conjure up on our own. It's not something we have to force ourselves to do. We go to God, and if we're aligned with God and we have this relationship with Jesus, then the strength of the Lord is a available to us. We have to receive it, but it's an imperative. Paul writes it as an imperative, a command statement, but it's a passive command in Greek to receive. So receive strength from the Lord in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
Because the devil's out there to seek who he can, you know, to steal, to kill, and destroy. To who he can destroy. But he really doesn't have much power. He's a defeated foe. I've said it before, but Sun Tzu, the great Chinese military leader that we still study in like the, you know, the war college and military training and stuff like that. Sun Tzu said, supreme victory lies not in defeating your enemies in combat, but supreme victory lies in defeating your enemies before combat is engaged. What I want you, everybody to understand is the devil is already defeated. Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. Jesus caused this to happen. And, you know, I, you know I, while I was getting ready and shaving this morning and stuff, you know, I have some stuff on. I generally watch Furtick and, um, you know, um, I've gone blank, Morris. What's his first name? <laughs> Robert. Robert Morris. You know, and I listened to them you know, on Sunday morning, and one of the things that uh, was talking about is, uh, Stephen Furtick was saying, you know, I really think that Satan was probably celebrating on Friday about how he won this battle, but then come Sunday morning, all of a sudden Jesus shows up, and it's like, I'm here for the keys. You know, you're defeated, you know, and there's some shock and surprise going on there. Satan is defeated. We have to remember that he's defeated. We need to remind the spiritual powers and authorities, like it says in the Word of God up on the screen, you know, that they are defeated. We're victorious in Christ. We need to live as if we're victorious. And sometimes that's challenging and hard to do. You know, these things, these frustrations and difficulties and stuff come against us, and, you know, we just sometimes have to remind ourselves where we stand with God. You know, I, Jackie asked me this morning how I was, how my week was. Well, some of it was really good, and some of it really stinks. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just that's just the way life is, and you know, and so you know, I started getting into a little bit of a pity party, and you know, and all this stuff. And Tony's like, "Yeah, it'll be okay. It'll be, you know," and I was like, rawr, 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 rawr. you know, and so. And so I'm praying about it, and what do I hear is, like, pick up the Word of God and start reading. Well, like, I'm thinking to myself, like, what good will that do? And, and, but I did it, you know, and it started, you know, this peace started coming in my heart about some of this stuff. And, you know, that's the way it really is. You know, we, we, we get back into the Word of God. We get realigned with God, and like it, it, it said... Be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. I receive that strength from God to overcome this in my mind. The battle is in my mind. Yes, the battle is out in the world in the minds of other people and stuff. But for me personally, I need to win the battle by the way I think. You know, my emotions, my words, my actions follow my thoughts. So I need to be strong in the Lord and remember what? Jesus says to do and how to act and how to follow. Okay, so we're struggling against these cosmic powers or the present darkness. Okay, in the day of Paul, those cosmic powers would be the, the main gods of the Greek or Roman pantheon. That, that's the term that would be used for that, for like Zeus and stuff like that. You know, we're struggling against this dynamic, dynamic, you know what I mean. You know, the, the evil influences and power out there that are trying to come against us. And we're struggling against that. They had that in the world of the first century. We have it today. It's just the tactics are different. You know, it, you know today those tactics hide themselves as, you know, humanistic thought. Put self on the throne. I'm my own God. I can do everything myself. It's all about me. Okay, and so those are the things that we struggle against with, you know, the world system out there with what the powers are trying to be. So the scripture says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God because it's all interactive. If I say I can put on the armor of God, but I don't need this piece of it, then I'm lacking. I'm vulnerable. Okay, and so take on the whole armor of God so that we can be able to withstand in the evil day. 
And when we've done all that we can do to stand, we stand firm. We stand even though it's difficult and challenging. And there's some people here, you know, you have some challenges and difficulties, but you can stand firm on the promises of God and you can have the peace of God. We're going to talk about the gospel of peace today. But the reality is, is that if we want to know the truth, that we want to understand what it really means to have the readiness given by the gospel of peace, we need to understand that we also have the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness of God. God's given us His righteousness, but He also commands us and Jesus tells us to live and do acts of righteousness. Not to earn our way into heaven, but to, out of love and association and fellowship with God, we do acts of righteousness. But that helps us with this thing of the gospel of peace. So we need to understand, what does this mean, the gospel of peace? Gospel is a, an old English word meaning good news. I mean, that, that's literally what it is. It's an old English word, good news. But we're talking about peace. We're not talking about just, oh, I'm going to get saved and get a ticket out of hell or anything like that. That's not what this is about. That's only part of it. We're talking about this holistic peace of God. The, in the Greek, it's a reine. In Hebrew, it's shalom. They mean the same thing. It's a holistic peace of I have relationship peace. It's not the absence of warfare. It's the fulfillment and fullness of a relationship with other people and with God. It's a fulfilling thing. So it's more than just the absence of contention or conflict in your household or in the world around you. There's more to it than that. And so that's what we're going to talk about and what that means to us today, how we do that. So <clears throat> Paul's writings, all of these things about the armor of God, they refer back to something, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Old Testament in Isaiah, primarily in Isaiah. But Isaiah predicts this thing and talks about what Messiah is going to do and so what Jesus does for us. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. The word there in, in the Hebrew, good news, same kind of thing as in the New Testament. It is about the idea of bringing news after something you're concerned or worried about. You know, there's a contention. Generally, this is about what's happened in a military conflict. And somebody's bringing the news of victory. Okay, you'll see the same word used in the Old Testament when word came back about the victory of God's people. And so that's the good news. But it's, we're publishing peace and happiness and there's joy and salvation because God reigns. The question is, if you're going to have the gospel of peace, this good news, does God reign in my life or am I on the throne? Do I want to have the peace of the good news? Or do I want to live the world's way? The question is, is God on the throne in my life? Or am I on the throne? <clears throat> Excuse me. But <clears throat> um, now, I have to say it this way. There's pollen in the air, but Tawny and I were out mowing grass yesterday morning, and I was mowing off a lot of ragweed. And so I was breathing in this ragweed. So it's still bothering me a little bit. So if y'all bear with me a little bit about this, about my voice this morning. But our God reigns. It is no doubt our God reigns. When Jesus walked the earth, he went into the uh, synagogue in Nazareth where he grew up. And he goes in there and he gets the scroll of Isaiah and he, and he, goes, he turns to this passage that we call Isaiah chapter 61. And he's, he reads this in their presence and then he tells them that this word is being fulfilled even now as you listen and you pay attention to this. And I can imagine that, that if he's in his hometown where he grew up and his siblings are there, and you know Mary's there and all this stuff. I can just imagine these people in the synagogue going, "Hey, dude, you know we know you. We know your background. What is this now that you're fulfilling this word of God from Isaiah that says the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. This is the same good news that we were talking about in the Gospel of Peace. 
It's the same thing that Isaiah had foretold 750 years earlier, that the Messiah was going to bring this good news. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Okay, so Jesus talked about that. He talked about you know, giving sight to the blind and talking about how he's going to make people aware of what's going on, opening the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Okay, so, so Jesus is proclaiming that he's going to do this based upon what Isaiah had to say. But if you think about the miracles that Jesus did, so Jesus, you know, in the Gospel of John, is talking about Jesus heals the, the man born blind. And the people, the religious leaders, couldn't accept this. They couldn't deal with this idea that Jesus healed this man born blind. You know, so they sent for his parents and they bring him in and, you know, and they, they start debating about this thing about this man born blind, whether he was really blind or not. Okay? And so, th all through this thing, you know, eventually they kick the guy out because they say, you're just a sinner, we don't have anything to do with you. This Jesus guy, he's not, you know, he's not real. He, we don't accept him as, as a preacher, as a messiah or anything like that. And so they kick him out. Jesus found him, you know, went to meet him and gave him comfort about the thing and encourage him. And they're talking about the idea that there's people about spiritual blindness. And I'm trying to put it into words that the idea that, that these people are blind and Jesus is trying to set them free because he's proclaiming this good news to those who are bound. You know, that also could be translated those who don't see, those who are, that don't understand spiritually what's going on. And so the, he's, he's telling the man who was born blind that the Pharisees, the, the Sanhedrin, the people who were trying to oppose him, they don't understand what's going on. And the Pharisees that overhear this, well, surely we're not blind, are we? He's, you know, and Jesus is, has to explain tell them, explain to them. It's because you think you see the truth that your guilt remains. Jesus came to open our spiritual eyes, to help us understand what the truth is, how to live, how to act, and how to be. This idea of the gospel of peace is much more than just trying to get a ticket out of, out of hell. You know, it's not about avoiding that kind of spiritual death. It's, that's only part of it. The idea of this gospel of peace is that we can have a holistic relationship with God and with other people that brings us peace and comfort. And for those who mourn, you know, to give them a headdress instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning. Okay, you know, it's okay to grieve when you lose something or you lose somebody you know, your relationships are severed from death or some other thing, it's okay to grieve. But when we grieve and it's destroying us and we can't get past it, we, there's, there could be a problem. And we need to go to God and let God heal us and bring us peace. The good news is that God walks with us and He talks with us. You know, uh, there's an old, old song about, you know, the... I go to the garden in the, uh, in the morning, and it talks about how I, uh, you know, while the dew is still on the roses, and I, he, and he, Jesus, he walks with me and talks with me and tells me that I am his own, and the joy that we share when we tarry there, no other has ever known. The idea is, is that if I can go in and I can have this time with Christ. He works peace in me. He works in my heart. He brings me to something that I can't do on my own. But that's a peace to share with other people also. It's not just for myself, but it's to share with others. And how do we do that is a challenge. 
Some people think that we've got to have all of these great big programs and you know, we've got to put money into this and do that and we go off and do all these things. And I'm going to challenge everybody to think a little differently. It's about the way I live that people can see Christ in me. Okay? Um, you know, the deal is that there's, there's times in my life when, you know, try but fail sometimes, but try to live a godly life. And, you know, God's empowering me and strengthening me to do this. You know, the Word of God says that I've been crucified with, with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This life I now live in the body, I live in faith, faith in the Son of God who loved me and who sacrificed Himself for my sake. I walk through these things together. You know, um, there's just, you know, there's too many examples, but the deal is, is that if I'm going to go share with somebody, I need to be able to share with them my testimony and my heart. It isn't about coming up with a thing out of Romans and say, here's the Roman road, and you come up with this great theolo theological set of statements to say, this is what you have to do to be saved. That's an okay thing, but most people don't care about that. Like I said a while ago, they don't, they don't know what the Scripture says. They don't care what it is. You know, if they're not believers. But they do care about whether you're real or whether I'm real or not. I've had people tell me in life over the years, like working at an in industry, TI, Raytheon, all that, said one lady that I worked with a lot, she came to me one time and said, I understand now what you were talking about those years ago about a relationship with God because of the way you live, the way you act, the way you did things. Okay? There's things, you know, when I was in the Navy that some people react, reacted negatively. <laughs> they didn't like the way I lived. But some people were cool with it and you can have a relationship with them. Okay, I didn't live the way some of my contemporary pilots lived. You know, some of those guys could be kind of wild. You know, Okay, and didn't matter whether they had a wife at home or not. You know, they could be kind of wild. Anyway, on deployment, I lived differently, but I hung with them. You know, we'd go to the O Club to eat together and do things together and stuff. I didn't participate in some of their lifestyle, but I was real to them. And they listened to what I had to say because first I was real to them in a real life. Not legalistic, not putting on a show, living one way and acting another. You know, talking one way rather than you know, acting another. But the book of Romans says, how are they going to believe if no one's sent? How are they going to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The, the problem is when you go into English and you translate this word as preaching, when it really means proclaiming or sharing, you know, you're sharing what God has done. People interpret these things in like the book of Romans as you got to have somebody like me standing up here saying all these things as preaching. When in reality, it includes that, but it's also about how we share in real life. Because somebody has to be out there in the world dealing with people, right? And... You know, how are they how are they to preach unless they're sent? Right? And it's written, how beautiful on the, are the feet of those who preach the good news. So Paul is paraphrasing what Isaiah had to say about here's this good news. You can have victory over this conflict in your life, this spiritual conflict, and you can do this because it's a good news story. And so, Lord who has believed what he has heard from us. Okay, there's going to be a lot of people who believe if we can share a real life story about my testimony. If I have that thing. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I want you to hear what that word of Christ means. It isn't just going out and saying, hey, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. No, it's about this revealed word. In 
in the Bible, there's two different words that are translated word into English. One is logos, and the other one is rhema. Rhema is the word that came to Mary when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and you know, told her about what God's plan was. And she said, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. Let your word be done. Okay, that was rhema, rhema word, a revealed word, something that was revealed and told. That's the same word that's here. The word of Christ is the revealed word. If we're open to allowing God and the Holy Spirit to flow through our lives and work in our lives, we're going to have a revealed word that we can share with other people. And that faith comes from hearing that thing that connects to them in their situation. Not some canned speech that we think applies to everybody in every situation. We need to be able to open up and understand the needs of the person. Paul talked about he wants to be, you know, he dies to himself so that he can be everything to everybody else in order to save a few. The idea is, is that if I can be and relate to people, then they can hear what I have to say. And so that hearing, that hearing of faith comes through the revealed word of Jesus working through us and in us. And so it's not some canned speech. The idea here is, is that if we bounce over to the book of Revelation, they conquered him, that is the accuser of the brethren, that's Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The issue is, is that it doesn't say that they conquered by coming in with a, you know, a sound theological statement or some legal documentation to say this is what you have to be do to be saved. It says by the word of their testimony because they love not their lives even unto death. They loved God and related with God supremely and that was above and beyond any other thing. And so through the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and it's just really sometimes a real challenge to be able to come up with what to say and what does this really mean in life. But when we go to God and we allow the Holy Spirit to operate in us, He'll do things and cause things to happen and bring things to the truth, the forefront, that we don't know where they came from. You know, you'll remember something that happened in the past and you'll be able to speak to it and talk to it about how important some of these things are. You know, my sister asked me one time, uh, how do you know these things? I, and I said, I don't know. Sometimes God just brings it there, and it's just there. When we're open to God moving in our lives, we have these words that actually connect to people in their situation. But we have to be in tune with God to do that. We have to allow the Holy Spirit and open ourselves up to allow the Holy Spirit to do that because God doesn't force Himself upon us. You know, God isn't like that. He doesn't force us to do things. He'll work with us and encourage us and try and direct us into doing the right thing, but He's not going to force us to say or do the right things. See what I'm saying? It really is kind of a challenge. Um, I don't know how many of y'all have have challenges with family, okay? You know, that think you're nuts, you know, if you believe in this God thing. I have people like that. You know, okay. you know but I grew up in church. I, I mean, I, I really, I grew up in church. I never doubted that Jesus was real. I never doubted that God existed because we were there all the time. Okay, some of y'all have heard me say this before, sometimes five, six, seven times a week. Okay, you know, and you know, my great grandfather started the choir at the church, my grandfather was the choir director, my, you know, all of these, you know, all of this stuff. Okay, I'm named after a minister, you know, it's just all of these things. But all of that didn't really mean anything until I made a commitment to follow Jesus myself, right? I never doubted any of this up. Remember, the demons believe that God is real, but that doesn't mean that they're following Him, 
I have to commit myself to this. And so I did. And my whole world changed. My whole outlook changed. It, it's dramatic how things can happen like that. But consequently, I have family members who think that, that you've just gone off the deep end. You know, you should just follow the rules and everything will be okay. No, I follow Jesus and everything will be okay. Right? When Tawny and I got married, we had people on both sides of the family thought we were lost because her side of the family thought, oh, how dare you marry somebody from that background? And my family was like, how dare you, you know, my mother's side, not my dad's side. My dad's side was fine with it. My mother's side, oh, they're lost. They're going to hell, you know. You know, because we went non-denominational. Her denomination thought this was bad. My denomination, family types thought this was bad. It doesn't matter. It's all about God. The problem, the thing that is, is that I had, we've had people on both sides tell us, oh, years later, this wasn't so bad. Your kids turned out good. You know, you're living a righteous life. Their kids, they're in jail, they're dead, they're on drugs. You know, it's like the, the denomination thing doesn't get you into heaven. It doesn't solve your problems. It's relationship with Jesus that deals with all of these things, right? That's what we're talking about here with this thing about the word of your testimony. Okay? You live a life, a godly life, because you're allowing the Holy Spirit to work and lead and guide and Jesus to be your shepherd. It's amazing how things turn out. It just really is. Doesn't mean everything is always perfect because we have this spiritual warfare coming against us that we have to stand against and fight. But we have this gospel of peace, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Just like I was saying a while ago, there were some rotten things. Okay? But you know what? God can deal with those things in my life, God can make things better. And I've, 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 I've shared this before, I know, so if you've heard it, good. You can correct me if I say it differently. But I, when I was in the Navy and the thing about having the stuff before, when my flight helmet was painted with all that reflective tape that you had to have on case you went down in the water at night and, you know, you know, reflect the light so they can find you in the sea. It's hard to find something in the sea, so reflective tape was important. You know, we had strobe lights and flares and all this other stuff too. If they don't find you right away, they're not going to find you, okay? So when I was in flight training, you could decorate your helmet up however you wanted. When you got to the squadron, they changed it to match the squadron pattern. But this is before I was in that squadron, and I had this helmet. It had a fish and a cross on the side of the helmet, <clears throat> which I'm confident in flight school some people liked and some people hated. You know, you know I'm confident. But it was a witness to who I was and what I was, whether they liked it or not, you know. But I wasn't angry about it. I wasn't being forceful on it. It's just, this is just making a statement. And I, I had it out. I got it out when I was at the recruiting command waiting to go to the squadron. And because they sent me there for a few weeks to go visit and talk with people for recruiting. And I got this thing out. And... You know, the corpsman that was there who was in charge of medical recruiting and stuff, he saw that. And he broke down in repentance right then. <clears throat> my brother's a pastor, and he's been telling me for years I need to get my life right with God. I didn't know what to do. I've told you this story before. I, I was like, what do I do now? You know, you know he, he's, he's right there. He's in tears, and he's repenting to God about his lifestyle. You know, about he's going to get straight with God. Well, okay, you need to talk to your brother, the pastor, and get this, you know. But <clears throat> the deal is, I didn't say a word beforehand. I hadn't talked to him about God ever before. The issue is that God works in people's hearts, and there's triggers that make this happen. You can share the gospel of peace in a lot of different ways. But what I want to encourage you is, don't be legalistic about it. Don't think you need to drum up some kind of thing where I need to go pound on somebody about it. It's not your job to whack them over the head and say, 
you know, you're evil, you're bad, you know, you know, there may be times when you need to share that kind of thing with somebody. But that's not the general case where you go out and you try and convince somebody of their their problems, right? They know they have problems. They know when they have sin. They know when they have a problem in their life that needs to get straight. You're there to help them go from that state to a state with God. And you do that in many different ways. It's not legalistic. It's about how you live your life. Okay. So let's stand. Let's pray. We're going we're gonna to close out. Lord God... There are so many different things that can kind of come into my mind to say. But there are <clears throat> they, they conflict with each other in terms of, I want to say this, I want to say that. But the reality is, is the Word of God is what stands firm. <clears throat> the Word of God says we're going to share the gospel of peace through the Word of Christ. And that Word of Christ is that revealed Word that you give us to share with other people at the time, the appropriate time. I pray, Father God, that you give us somebody right now as we're praying that we need to relate to, that we can pray for, that we can share with your way that the Word of Christ, the Rhema Word, the revealed Word of Christ, can flow through us to other people for their edification, for their salvation, for their well-being. But also, Lord God, I pray that you give us the revealed words to say to engage in spiritual warfare, to engage with the enemy because we're victorious. The enemy is defeated, but they need to take their hands and their deception away from our lives and from the lives of the people we know and that we love. I pray also, Lord God, that you give us prayer targets in our world for people to pray for, that they be brought into the kingdom and out of the kingdom of darkness and be brought into the kingdom of light, <clears throat> whether they're drug dealers or human traffickers, government leaders, whatever it is, Lord God, there are people that are leading this world into unrighteousness and suppressing the truth of righteousness. And they're deceived. But we want them to become undeceived. We want them to become members of the kingdom of God. And I pray you give us a direction on who to pray for and how to pray and how to relate, and how to do the right things, Lord God. I thank you, Jesus, for your grace. I pray that you make clear what you want each one of us to get out of today's message. However bad I may have fumbled the ball with delivery, Lord God, you have a message that you want each of us to get. And I pray, Father God, that we take that message and we carry it forth in our hearts, for our edification and development, but also for the benefit of other people around us. I pray that you touch each one of us to live your way, the way you want us to live. And the peace of the gospel, the fulfillment of that shalom peace. I thank you for this, Father God. And I pray once again that you be with the people that we have from our body, and our relatives and friends who are traveling, or who have COVID right now, or have some other kind of thing that they're struggling with, because there are many people right now who are struggling with, with COVID and illnesses and problems in their lives. And I thank you for this, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may have a wonderful day in Jesus. I pray that you all have a great day. Thank you for being here today. Go forth in God's peace. And even if you like me and you had like a week where it's like things were not so great sometimes, I pray that you have a great week going forward and a wonderful time and it all be good. Okay? <laughs>